and thank you for choosing to listen to Horse Heroes on Tour UK Edition. This is a podcast where floor screen markers from EHS Communications talks to equestrian entrepreneurs and superstars in open-hearted, frank and honest one-on-one conversations. My name is Jack and I truly hope you enjoy listening to some amazing stories from the world of British and Irish equestrian. Put your feet up, relax and enjoy. And then uh, we can start. Okay. okay. Already. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Messy or tidy? <laughs> I would say I would say tidy, but I think uh, Rebecca probably wouldn't agree. But no, I think I'm quite tidy. Yeah. Mowing the lawn or motorcycle? Oh God! Right, I would have said mowing lawn, but I think definitely now motorcycle. Australia or England? I have two lives. Grew up in Australia. Australia's an amazing place to grow up. <clears throat> what I do, very much England. Cooking or being cooked for? Um, I, I have to cook. You have to cook. Okay, cool. Let's get started. <laughs> and then the intro is coming. Okay. Um, then I have your in- introduction. Okay. British-born Garrett spent most of his childhood competing in a variety of equine sports while he lived in Australia. He returned to England at the age of 23. These days, he's a member of, the, of Team Great Britain. He was this year's Olympic team reserve in Tokyo and part of a silver medal winning team during the Europeans in Hagen. He is married to the gorgeous Rebecca and the happy dad of their talented daughter Ruby. Today is my guest, the wonderful Garrett Hughes. Hello Garrett. Thank you. Thank you for having me over. No, thank you. All the way in England. Yeah, all the way in England. So they let a, you in. Yes, they let me in. It's an exciting trip for me, I have Good. to say. Cause Good. I had, uh, we've done all the, the Dutch shows, so all the interviews okay. normally in Dutch, so yeah. I have to get used to it, to speak English. Well, your English is a lot better than my Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, well, that's, <laughs> oh, yeah that's, that's a good excuse. Yeah. What we always do when we start the interview, yeah. we go... Uh, way back in time okay. and start uh, mm-hmm. where you were born and where you grew up, so yep. if you can tell me that. Okay, so um, I was born in the UK, <clears throat> I was born in a, a village called North Allerton up in uh, Yorkshire, um, and uh, when I was six, my dad, through work, got a transfer to Australia. So as a six-year-old boy, um, mum, dad, and at that point, three sisters, yeah. uh, we moved to Australia, to uh, Queensland. Do you remember that moving? I, do you know what? There's a couple of things I, I remember. I remember, there's obviously, I sort of had little snapshots of, of, of growing up over here. One of my memories of actually moving to Australia is... Um, at that point, uh, mum rode a little bit. <clears throat> she had a, a horse that she used to do a little bit of hunting and things on, but I wasn't really interested in horses, but I had a horse book, yeah. a big hardback horse book, which had pictures of all different types of horses in it. And I do remember that through the school I went to, is I think it was like probably every Friday or something, we got a sticker, and I used to put my stickers inside my book. Oh, really? And um, when we moved to Australia, because we were moving, we were only able to take so much stuff yeah. and mum and dad said I couldn't take my horse book and, oh. I, and I cried um, and I was able to take my horse book and I remember walking onto the plane and having my horse book under one arm <laughs> my little bag under the other um, and then moving to Australia yeah so that was actually mm. your most important item it was my most horse. which was which, and I had no idea because at that point I'd never ridden a horse no. I'd, I'd never but there was obviously sort of something in there that yeah. was going to come out later on in life yeah, so then you moved to Australia. Yeah. How long did you live there? So I grew up over there. So I, six when we moved, and I was 23 when I came back to, uh, came back to the UK. So I, I grew up Australian. I did all my, all my schooling over there, um, you know, my childhood, teenage, early adulthood, mm. into my 20s over there. And how did you actually, after the horse book, came in contact with real horses? What happened? So... Um, where we where we grew up, we grew up in a, in the south of Brisbane, and I grew up in a um, a town called Jimboomba. So yeah. there you go, that's a good Aussie name. Yeah. Um, Jimboomba, and uh, we had a bit of land. And so you know, it was it, 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 Australia is huge, and especially you know when you go back 
25, 30 years, it was a lot of people had these smaller property, well, small properties were over there. Um, so we had 10 acres. Living in the country, 10 acres, what do you do? You get pony. Yeah. And I think, you know, that was sort of from my, my mum. She sort of thought, oh, it would be nice for the, for the kids to ride. And so uh, we got a little pony. And then, um, and it was one of those typical little grey ponies that, you know, used to throw you off and dump you and, and things and sort of hated it. Um, but actually there was a, a gentleman that had moved just into the area called Trevor Bonney. And yeah. he, was, he was an old-fashioned, all-round Aussie horseman. He was equivalent to a, an American cowboy. You know, he did everything. And um, so we went to him and I started having lessons at, at his place. Yeah. I remember the very, very first lesson was in a round pen, yeah. you know, getting on a horse. And I remember his son at that time worked for an ice cream company and he came home with some ice cream. So I remember my very first lesson having an ice cream. So that, that was very exciting. Um, so I just started with him. And um, my sister, we, I've got four sisters. Um, my younger sister was born in, in Australia, and we all started to ride through 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 Trevor. So Trevor Trevor made it a lot of fun. I mean, we you know we used to do we call it hacking over here, but lots of rides. He had a river behind his property, so he used to go ride through the oh, river yeah, and really nice. bareback and go swimming with the horses. Yeah. It's sort of you know that sort of lifestyle that you can imagine in Australia. Um, but um, it was sort of something that, as I started, it just became what well, it became me. You know, I just I just wanted to be around horses, wanted to be with horses. Um, so I used, I started doing more and more with him. And so, but over in Australia, we have um, a big sort of Western circuit yeah. and youth circuit, and we have um, this. So it's called Australian Stock Horse. You know, um, and all, all these sort of different um, aspects to the equine industry, as mm -hmm. well as the dressage, the eventing, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm Jim Boomba. It wasn't the epicenter of world dressage. No. <laughs> um, so I grew up doing Western and English and showing. And I actually grew up in the Iranian industry, so I showed in hand. And and then the my group of friends in that area were all involved in the Arabs as well. So there's a real group of us that sort of grew up and came through the youth. And um, But I was always interested in, in the riding, and I was always interested in training. So yeah. even at a very, very young age, I had no idea really what I was doing. But... I, you, know, you felt something yeah, more than just yeah, yeah. And, and I wanted to do it and so I was that kid you know we didn't have an arena I used to ride my horses after school in the field you know and I was that kid I used to sort of get on my horse and I used to go down there and sort of practice halting and then doing these little workouts and, and I had no idea really back then what I was doing but I was sort of really I just wanted to train horses Back then, I just thought I was riding them. But then, then, then I'd ride my horse down to my friend's place. Then we'd ride to the shop, and yeah. um, then we'd go out bareback. And then I'd go and round up some cattle. And so it was a real sort of all-round, all-round sort of horsemanship, sort of like growing up. Um, dressage at that point was nothing that I'd ever done. Um, but again, looking back on it, there was little things that were, I suppose, happening that we're going to eventually pull me to where I am now. Yeah. For instance, um, my Christmas present of my grandparents who were in the UK was the British Dressage magazine. Oh, yeah. So I used to follow the dressage, um, even though I never followed it in Australia. Um, so I sort of had this pull. And then through my teenage years, I just kept doing, I was um, very involved in the Arabian industry, um, showing showing classes and, and, and in hand and things like that, basically doing anything with horses. Um, and then the, the Arabian shows over there are huge, and especially the performance side of it, and then they had some dressage tests. So oh, yeah. I started to do some very, very low level, what we call prelim over here, which mm -hmm. is walk, trot, canter, so yeah. across, things like that. Um, but I started to sort of do a little bit of, like, bit of that, and I, I, used, I started to get a bit, not obsessive about it regarding me doing it, but then starting to follow it. And <clears throat> it's, I mean, you wouldn't think so. It, it wasn't that long ago, but... You know, back then we had no internet. No, you know, there was no YouTube. No, 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 no. There was no. There so was you no, couldn't look up anything. So you couldn't look at anything. Yeah. So then I used to start buying. Like you know, then all of a sudden video recorders came out, and yeah. I used to buy the VHS tapes of the Europeans and World Equestrian Games. So I used to, even though I wasn't doing it, I used to start following it. Um, and then there was little things that sort of happened through my teenage years. Like um, I was at an Arabian competition, and I remember coming out of a class. 
and this lady, this old lady came up to me and she said, where are your parents? And I was like, oh, um, they're over there. Yeah, what did I do? And she was like, I want to teach you. Oh. I was like, okay. I have no idea who you are. So anyway, she went and talked to my parents. And she was an old lady called Ollie Nunn. And she was the mother of a five-star, current five-star judge called Mary Seafried in Australia. Oh, wow. And, and so this old lady, so this, and also all of a sudden there was this sort of step sort of towards where I was going to go without me actually realising it. So I used to have some lessons off her, and then um, I was sort of got to about sort of 15, 16, and then there was a big equestrian centre not far from where we live called Pine Lodge, and they brought over a trainer from the UK called Sandra Pearson Adams, who mm. was a fellow of the British Horse Society. Yeah. So I went to her, and then I started having lessons off her. And so slowly my my riding was, even though my riding at home was still very... Should we say Australian riding the horse down to your friend's place and swimming and stuff like that? I started doing some sort of more training, more, should we sort of say, dressage training. And yeah. so slowly I sort of start to get the bug without without sort of fully going into it. Um, so I used to follow it a lot and then I sort of got the bug. And then um, I was always going to do horses because I was pretty useless at school. Um, I was actually, when I finished school, I was either going to play saxophone professionally Oh, or ride horses. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. What did you want? To, growing up as a child, what did you want to yeah. be? Well, I was always going to ride. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, I went to school and because you had to, because I had to. <laughs> um, I was a pretty average student, um, but my mum's a music teacher. Oh. So we all do music, but I, I played saxophone throughout my school. So I was in bands at school. And so when I left school, I thought, well, there's only two things I can do: it's either riding horses. Or saxophone. Yeah. So, um, but <laughs> I wasn't that good at the saxophone either. So, well, I was better at horses than the saxophone. So anyway, it was going to be horses. But at that point, um, it was going to be horses, but I didn't know what it was going to be. So I was still very involved in Western um, and things like that. So I had no idea which route it was going to go down. But I didn't care. No. I, you know, at that point, I had no, you know, it's that thing you can always grow up having the ambition to want to ride at the Olympics and things because that's what you do but I just wanted to ride horses that that was it no matter what it was I rode horses so it was you know riding backing babies or doing a bit of competing or riding a western class or rounding up cattle or you know any of those things it didn't matter it was just it was just horses but within me doing that I very much started to follow dressage yeah um so what happened was, is that my parents then moved back to the UK. And 14 years later, they moved back to the UK. Yeah. And myself and my other sister stayed in Australia. And um, I got to the age of 23 and I thought, you know what I should do before I really settle down? I should come to England. Well, being male thinking this is, <laughs> is I actually thought what I was going to do, I was going to come back to the UK for a couple of years because I thought I'll do that before I settle down in Australia and, you know, possibly meet somebody and blah, blah, blah. I'm going to come over to the UK, I'm going to get a British accent, because back then, anybody with a British accent in Australia was teaching lots and oh, yeah. lots of money, because obviously you knew more. <laughs> um, so I thought I'm going, to come to, um, I'm going to come to England for two years and um, get an accent, go back to Australia, and then all of a sudden my career would be in front of me. Yeah. So... What happened was, is, is the, the 12 months before my parents moved back, is I was thinking about doing this. So I actually came over to England on holiday, and I got offered a job in Holland. Oh, wow. Yeah, I did. I got offered a job in Holland. and um, How? So back then it was through, because obviously, again, it wasn't through social media and things these days no. where you can connect up no, with anybody. No, no. Um, it was through an equine agency. So I came over to England and my, my parents were going to move back the year after. So it was like, well, should I go and talk to this agency and see if there's any jobs over here? Because if this is maybe, do I follow mum and dad? So I got offered a job in Holland. Um, so I went back to Australia to, you know, we sort of sold up the couple of horses we had and things like that. Um, and I went to Holland and I lasted, I think, about two and a half weeks. Well, who did you work for? Um, it was an old gentleman, sort of, I just knew him as Mr. Gilhouse. <gasps> oh, Henry Gilhouse. Yeah. Um, and... I, um, I, I so, didn't know that. Yeah. I know him. I knew him. Right, yeah. So, um, 
<clears throat> my recollection of him wasn't very good. I'm, he might have been a lovely gentleman, I don't know. And, I mean, um, without saying any more, I can understand why it lasted two and a half weeks. I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. I went there. You know, growing up in Australia, you know, where I was, a sort of country town, you know, and, and it's very different. And then coming to some... And again, back then, you know, going to... Flying to the other side of the world, going to a country where I didn't know the language or anything, no. you just didn't do that back then, you know. And I was a young lad... And I got there, and um, there have been certain things that have been promised with the job and stuff, and none of it, none of it was there. Um, and um, it, yeah, two, two and a half weeks, and I actually spent two and a half weeks there. Flew back to England, got on the next plane back to Australia, and then that was it. I was never coming back. I mean, that actually put me off coming to Europe ever again. I thought I don't want that. Don't want that lifestyle. Wow. Um, I don't want to be treated like that. Um, it turned me off. Yeah. Of ever coming to Europe, um, it um, it was it was awful. Um, so what happens? My parents moved back. So then we fast forward a couple of years, um, and then it was like, okay, I need to give this another go because my mom and dad are over here. I can come to mom and dad. Yeah. So I came over here, and the plan was to spend a couple of years um, and go back. Um, and twenty whatever years later, I'm still here. Yeah. You are still here mm. and you're still coming to Holland a lot now. And I'm coming to Holland. <laughs> like it's it's it, yeah. sort of bizarre how it changed. So, I mean, when I first came over again, I didn't I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, I came to England because I was sort of stuck in a bit of a rut in Australia. Yeah. My career wasn't moving forward. I didn't know what I was going to do, so I thought, well, why not come to England? And even when I came to England, um, I worked um, at a couple of yards just doing a bit of riding and things like that. I didn't know whether I wanted to do dressage or I wanted to do... Um, Western at that point. That's why I decided I was going to do one or the other. So I was either going to be a rainer, mm -hmm. rain rider, or I was going to do dressage. So I've been over here about 12 months and actually got offered a job at a very successful uh, raining yard over here, which actually has, and they have horses in America and things like that. And then I thought, you know what, if I'm going to do Western, I'll go back to Australia. Yeah. So if I'm going to stay in England, I need to do... Um, I need to sort of maybe have a look at this dressage thing. So back then, to earn a living, I'd clip horses, I'd mark out horses for people, I'd sort of teach lower level, I'd do anything and everything. So I'm in my mid-twenties at this point. Yeah. Um, I had no money. My parents don't have any money. We didn't have a yard or anything like that, so I had no money. So I was basically doing anything and everything just to be around horses. I didn't care what I did. I just wanted to be around horses. Um, so just working on a couple of yards, then I went out self-employed, freelancing, you know, again, just doing it in anything and everything, giving a Western lesson, showing an Arabian at an Arabian show, you know, doing this, that and the other. And then um, one of my students I was helping had a dressage horse, inverted commas, um, and she wanted to know if I'd do a couple of classes on it. So I did, um, I did start to be able to compete a little bit. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, there was a, there's obviously a few other things that sort of happened sort of through all this that starts to send you down this route. But one of my first breaks was that um, my parents lived in Cheshire. And just down the road from my parents' place was um, a gentleman called Stephen Clark. Yeah. And Stephen, you know, is one of our formidable big five-star judges. Um, and so I rang him. And I said to Stephen, I said, hi, you don't know me. My name's Gareth Hughes. <laughs> I've been over here for a couple of years doing this, that, and the other. At this time, I'd ridden a couple of low-level horses, and I'd won a few, like, local classes. I think I'd won a regionals. Um, and he said, oh, yes, I've actually seen you around riding. And I said, well, could you give me any advice? And he was lovely, you know, like Stephen is. He's a very gracious man. He, he you know, gives his time to everybody. And he was just very nice, and he just said, you know, just keep working away, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, right, thanks very much. Lovely to speak to you phone down so off I went back into you know everything and then a few weeks later he rang me and he said I've got two stallions that have come in for training for they're here for six eight weeks none of my girls want to sit on them do you want to would you be interested in coming yeah. down and riding them and I was like yes yes so <clears throat> I was this Aussie lad so I turned up to ride these horses on my first big dressage yard in my western boots, jeans, long chaps, and a baseball cap <laughs> on backwards. 
<laughs> and that's how I turned up. I didn't own a pair of breeches. I mm. didn't own, you know, to, to, I had a, one pair of competition breeches. I had a pair of old black boots, um, so, cause I competed a couple of times. I had no breeches that I wore through the day. I was just in long chaps and jeans and western boots. Anyway, I went and rode these horses and, um, Stephen was very good with his time. He helped me a little bit and then they went home and then that was it. And then, um, so what that did, at least gave me a connection. Yeah. And then again, through a little bit of time, I got another ride on a horse, and then I was able to call him and say, could I start having lessons off you? Yeah. So then I started having lessons off him. Um, and then, you know, things sort of started to snowball along then. I, I think then there was a, a client of his that lived in the um, Isle of Man, and they wanted to sell a horse. And so they said to him that, he said to them, to send the horse to me. So I kept the horse at Stephen's yard. Um, and they sent the horse over to me and I rode it for a couple of months and I sold it for them. Through that period, they bought a young horse in Holland. Oh. And so when I sold that horse, they said, well, we've actually just bought this young horse in Holland. It was a Wolfgang Gelder. Um, and uh, they said, would you be interested in campaigning it for 12 months or a season, a summer season? And I was like, great. So they knew Stephen. So the horse came over and was based on Stephen's yard. Um, and I won my first national championship that year. Oh, home. wow. Um, and then so slowly, so, you know, then I was able to keep my horses on Stephen's yard yeah. and sort of slowly through that I picked up another ride and then I did a bit more teaching. I'm starting to think, right, this dress-ups thing now is the route I want to go to. I was actually, I felt like it was going somewhere.